I, and if you've, if you've read the preview on the website, I had kind of a two-part talk. One was how I was going to use, how I was, how I was using uh, matplotlib for surviving graduate school, and the other was how I was using matplotlib for goofing off uh, when I was um, finished with grad school. And uh, you'll, you'll see in a couple of minutes how I kind of use the same, same stuff I learned in one arena to have a little more fun in the other arena. So what I was, what I was doing was first plotting um, genomic data from the bacteria that I studied in grad school, and you can see a little one of them in the corner of the screen there. And the other thing I was doing was uh, kind of goofing off with this data that Major League Baseball has on their website that kind of shows the behavior of all the pitches they, uh, their pitchers have thrown over um, a few years now. So the first half of the talk, uh, what I was doing in grad school, I, the lab I joined has been studying this cyanobacterium prochlorococcus for now, well, they actually are the ones who discovered it in the late 80s, and they've focused on it ever since. And they, the reason they found it so interesting, there are, there are several reasons. First of all, it's actually very, it's a very simple organism. It's, uh, most of them are about half a micron across, which is pretty small even by the standards of bacteria. Uh, they divide once a day, which is pretty slow compared to the usual lab rats like E. coli that are more like, uh, more like uh, once in a hour or half hour. Uh, most of the genomes we study are uh, less than 2,000 genes, and that, again, even by the standards of bacteria, is pretty tiny. There are, there are simpler bacteria that grow in very specialized environments and have lost much of their ability to kind of keep themselves, sustain themselves, and they, they live as... Uh, symbiotes inside of other organisms, so they have smaller genomes. But here we have a bacteria that has a small genome and yet has all the tools it needs to be a, an ox oxygenic phototroph, that is it splits water and fixes carbon dioxide in photosynthesis like a plant chloroplast does. So that means it needs this whole package of genes for the for encoding photosystem one and photosystem two and the, the carbon concentrating and carbon fixing mechanisms. And that takes up a pretty big percentage of the genome. And I'm not sure what the, uh, yeah, that was displaying better on the other one, but that was just a, uh, going to be a picture of the um, you know, let's see if I. Yeah, that yeah that was just a map of the world and showing where uh, where the chlorophyll concentration is highest and lowest and what. What the point of that is for Prochlorococcus is that Pro actually thrives in the areas of the ocean that are kind of the, the most difficult to grow in because the uh, nutrient concentrations are lowest. So it's a little ironic that they're most numerous where it's the most difficult to grow, but the important thing there is that there's less competition from other more complicated cyanobacteria or, or photosynthetic eukaryotes or other things that compete for the same niche. And Prochlorococcus with its small size and again its simple genome and uh, simple cell architecture in general has an advantage in um, 
in surviving in that, that kind of environment. And, yeah. I, Do you want to try to hang out? I worry that the other pictures will be as bad as that first one, but I guess they're, I guess it's just that. Well, Well, let me. Okay. Yeah, most of these are. Okay, yeah. Hey, Greg. Yeah? Brian has his announcement too. So oh, okay. We want to take a quick break. Yeah. Because I think it would yeah. be helpful. Okay, so guys, real quick, we're going to break in. variability and they are the the kind of the hot spots for relatively rapid genetic change in the prochlorococcus lineage and conversely if you plot those core genes or the, the photosynthetic genes or the cell division genes they kind of avoid those hot spots and they're in uh, what are the the lower parts of this graph and don't uh, vary so much between um, the sequence examples. Was was there a question? Uh, the question was about the, the iron stress and phosphate stress example I mentioned earlier and how, there, how genes relating to resisting phosphate starvation or, or surviving iron starvation are found in different parts of the world in Prochlorococcus. And what, what the questioner was asking is, are those genes then concentrated in the, these highly variable islands? And the answer is very much yes, and that's been one of the one of the big stories we've kind of developed in the in the time I was uh, in the lab, and I wasn't I didn't have so much to do with the iron or phosphate starvation stories, but I had a lot more to do with 
tolerate uh, the story of how different strains tolerate changes in light intensity. And that's actually what I was showing here when I first made this plot. Um, you see in the legend I'm talking about HLI genes. The HLI stands for highlight inducible. And these were genes that were known for some time to be upregulated when these cells are exposed to changes in light intensity or increases in light intensity. And what we found is there were actually different kinds of highlight inducible genes. Uh, a core set that are found in all prochlorococcus and are found in those, those core regions of the genome I was talking about. And then a phage-like set that seemed to actually be inserted in the genome and carried between cells by the, uh, the phage, the virus that infects these cells. And those are uh, generally piled up in those uh, more highly variable regions. So that's what the, uh, the X's and O's are showing you here and the, the phage-like ones are especially concentrated in, in that highly variable region. Yeah? How many sequences did you prepare to get that? And what kind of software does it use? And how long does it take to get that? Um, this plot is generated just from those 12 sequence genomes that I talked about that were kind of the first wave we got. And deciding Deciding whether a gene is, uh, has been basically gained rather than lost in the evolution of Prochlorococcus is, uh, it took a little while, but I, I pretty much wrote all that in Python and uh, did that myself. And it, as I recall, it ran in, uh, hour or so, so it wasn't a terribly huge job. And again, I, I was doing a lot of the initial number crunching in Python, even when I made the first version of this chart and the other chart with a mishmash of other tools. So I was, I was had, I had one foot in the Python landscape and one foot in very unfriendly landscape and actually that's that's what I wanted to talk about next is kind of my journey through this uh, what I was doing was doing a lot of number crunching in Python and dumping results to a spreadsheet or a CSV file and re-importing that in R and making a plot in R and I I don't want to trash R too much because it's a fairly nice plotting tool, but I never really could get it to the that last 10% of polish and uh, things like getting the figure legend in the right place and getting uh, the the colors the way I wanted them and getting uh, line widths and everything in the in the right uh, ranges generally meant touching things up in Illustrator uh, after exporting a postscript, postscript file from R. And that, that was okay when I did it once, and that's kind of how I fell into it. Then my advisor would have some comments or recommendations, or you need to fix this. And I'd find myself starting over uh, again doing some of it in Python and doing some of it in R and doing some of it by hand in Illustrator and generally forgetting where I was and of course the the worst part is when you come back six months later and you have a directory full of plots you made somehow you might even be able to find the Python scripts that you used and the R scripts that you used and the the illustrator steps, of course, are just mousing around by hand, so you can't put that in version control. And you, to some extent, have to start over every time. So, uh, like I said, I, I got through, I guess, my first couple of years in 
put out one paper doing things that way and then kind of swore I wasn't going to do this this way again. So that's when I started really digging into matplotlib and uh, finding, finding that there was pretty much an option or a setting for every little uh, option that I needed to change. So for example, my advisor was always telling me to make the fonts bigger because seems like the default font size in uh, every plotting package is too small to read in a PowerPoint presentation or uh, actually pretty small even in a printed publication. So she was on the, she was always on the campaign to make your font sizes bigger. And now I could just do that by changing one line and pushing a button and rerunning the script and avoid, avoid Illustrator as much as possible and avoid switching tools as, as much as possible. And even then I was, I kind of was now having to decide between putting all the options I wanted in either in the Python script that generated these files and then I could store that script or or uh, write it so it just takes a bunch of command line options and make sure I save a shell script or something with all those command line options. Neither of those was really uh, what I wanted and the trouble with the shell scripts is then I end up saving all these bash scripts all over the place so now I'm doing half of my programming in bash which is maybe even worse than doing it in R <laughs> and uh, on the other hand if I just put everything into the Python source file then I have essentially 20 different files to do a time series plot and now if I want to my advisor wants me to change something about how I'm plotting my time series I have to make 20 changes across 20 different files so the, the compromise I eventually stumbled across was kind of making a, a general purpose Python script and then putting all my options in these um, YAML files. And I kind of landed on YAML because I uh, liked it for its kind of Pythonness and indentation matters and uh, it was a little it's a little faster to type than JSON and about a million times faster to type than XML, so <laughs> I was in a hurry. And basically this, this kind of tells the story of an experiment, at, at least if you uh, are me and have been living in this world for several years. And it's basically showing the time points I want to plot from a, from a spreadsheet that I manually typed numbers into because in this case this is a plot of a experiment I did in the wet lab so there's some manual process involved uh, I can't make the Python script uh, transfer my cultures or move test tubes around yet and then different different treatment groups are just uh, these different groups here so I have a control and I have cultures that have been shifted into different light levels for different periods of time and I'm just saying uh, when I when I started that shock and when I ended and that's just in the number of hours into the experiment and the color I want it to pl be plotted with and not shown here but I just went back and kept adding more options for like which marker to use and uh, line widths and all the all the options you can uh, change in matplotlib to m make it look perfect and the again the experiment this is describing was a pretty simple experiment con in concept I was talking about how these different strains tolerate uh, light stress in different ways and I kinda wanna emphasize that even though these are photosynthetic organisms or because they're photosynthetic organisms they can actually poison themselves 
if you give them too much light energy at once. Um, partly because they have that that tiny genome and don't have the defense mechanisms that like a more complicated plant would have. They just generate all these um, free reactive oxygen species and those just react with the photosystem itself or with other cell mechanisms and uh, destroy the cell from within. If the cell doesn't have some mechanism of uh, getting rid of or surviving that extra energy and the story I really developed in the second half of my uh, graduate career was uh, how some of the how some of the strains were able to tolerate the, these changes in light intensity and some were not able to tolerate it. So I did a lot of these experiments. I think I made um, uh, probably uh, uh, probably hundreds of plots from them. So the that's kind of the story behind the a YAML file like this and I again probably made a hundred files like this and fed them all into one relatively smart Python script and how that script works I I excerpted kind of the most most fun part of it here and that was just um, looping through the contents of that uh, YAML structure which turns into a nested dictionary when it's imported into Python and basically for every group there's a uh, uh, there I, you saw there was a line for the uh, condition that it was exposed to and I what this is basically doing is with a lot of numpy magic uh, going through the the various rows of the spreadsheet and finding those that are relevant to what I wanted to plot for that group and it comes out it comes out as a nice declarative statement of which rows I actually want um, the right data are the ones that are the right time point the right experiment the right train and the right condition and then that just gives me all the data I need to give to the uh, matplotlib function on the last two lines and yeah, that one's ugly too so I'm gonna have to drag it over because it's too important trackpad on this thing is actually as, as bad as anything else and yeah. yeah why that why that was showing up in the slideshow on one computer and not the other I couldn't begin to tell you but that's that's a question for uh, I was experimenting with uh, making a presentation with restructured tests after doing doing them in LaTeX and Beamer for a while and uh, it's easier but apparently there's something about the way the PDF is saved that I need to look into but the the outcome is again this is the story I've been telling you about is these four different treatment groups plus a uh, control in gray are exposed to a, a much higher light intensity for one to four hours and 
what you're seeing is the cell fluorescence, which is kind of a, a proxy for the health of the culture and for the, and for the number of cells in the long run is uh, actually plummets within minutes of being, or within an hour at least, of being exposed to that higher light intensity. And then after that shock, the ones that have been exposed for a longer period uh, don't recover at all. And those that have been recovered, those that have been exposed for shorter periods bounce right back and are as good as new. And again, I did uh, uh, maybe a hundred of these plots and emphasized different things and did it for different strains and different periods of time and was able to crank those out pretty rapidly, at least once I had the data, because I had these scripts put together and uh, had, a, had by then a pipeline figured out. So, and again, just to talk about the versatility of the the time series script. This is actually a, another input file for the same script or maybe a, a later version of it. And in this case, the time series is actually the number of genomes you're adding to an experiment. And the result is the number of either unique genes or genes in common that you found. And that that's what gives you the the, that first plot I showed you. So this was that one that I did some by hand and some in R and some in Illustrator at the beginning of my career and now I was able to regenerate it using a script that I uh, pretty much um, had written for with an entirely different purpose in mind just by giving it a different set of input and that, yeah, that's the, that's the story I really wanted to tell is just how the, those little things like giving me the ability to organize everything on one page and uh, giving me the chance to fix font sizes and line widths and general visibility issues and uh, get things visible so so I could push one button and uh, I told my advisor once that the dream was just to have one script that would run all the uh, figure making scripts and then copy everything over into a LaTeX directory and compile my thesis and uh, yeah basically <laughs> basically do everything except write it and I didn't quite get that far I think I had to Copy. Uh, yeah, it's had some bugs. I think I had to copy the files by copy the image files by hand anyway, and never got around to writing a script to copy them over. So, and I had to write the thing, which was especially painful. But I got pretty close to that ideal, and that was all thanks to Matt Plotlib and. John Hunter's contributions. So, uh, yeah, when I I was actually talking to Brian, I think a couple days before we heard the news about him, that I might want to talk about how I'd used Matplotlib. So, when that news broke, it was pretty much time to go ahead and give this talk. And then, yeah, the more uh, the more fun part of this talk is going to be harder to show you because it was going to be more of a live demo. So, um, about 30% of the way through installing that plot <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'll have to set up Postgres too, so, and import my data. <laughs> Import my database and but 
Yeah, I... Uh, Yeah, so I can at least tell you what this is what this is about and show you a couple of images. So this was I guess I started thinking about it late in my graduate career and played around with it a little bit and since I graduated it's kind of been my hobby project and every time I'd want to learn about a new a new technology I'd folded into this project like I I actually had to spend time this week repairing all the damage I'd done because I was going to give it a big web interface and make it all J jQueryized and uh, definitely leaving that part out uh, for this talk but the the thing I was thinking about was this pitch effects data that I read about um, uh, a few years ago, and this is kind of the one of the big uh, G Wiz things in the baseball sabermetric community. So, if you've if you've read the book or seen the movie Moneyball now, you know about this community of nerds that kind of talk about how baseball people were crunching numbers in the wrong way and uh, how they could do it better and. Uh, people like Bill James didn't have the high-tech things like this, but they had plenty of data and went back and showed what really contributed to scoring runs and preventing runs and um, threw, some, threw some statistics at it that nobody had really thought rigorously about yet. And that was somewhat interesting to me, but also interesting was the new high-tech stuff. So this company has been putting these high-speed cameras in basically every major league ballpark now so that when a pitcher releases a ball making his pitch, he, uh, the ball is photographed uh, like a hundred times or something like that as it goes to home plate. And from that uh, they do a lot of image processing to find uh, and report what the what the speed of the pitch was, both when it uh, yeah when it left his hand and when it arrived at the home plate, uh, what its position was in the strike zone, and that's what uh, this figure is all about. Showing uh, this is actually a figure from the MLB website. If you've ever looked at the game day feature, it shows all the pitches as they're thrown now. Uh, it shows the the direction the pitch broke and the amount that it broke. So uh, a curveball generally breaks down and to the side, whereas a fastball stays up in the air a bit longer. And you can in this picture, you can kind of see the curvature on each pitch, and you can see, uh, I think the blue ones here are curveballs, and they're dropping a lot, uh, quite a bit faster than the, the fastballs that are uh, staying up or even out of the strike zone there. And it also, of course, uh, uh, they report the result of each each pitch, like uh, whether it was a call a ball or a strike, or if the batter swung at it and or put it in play or swung and missed, and um, from that you can kind of have a lot of fun. So they actually put all this data up on a website. I think the story I've kind of heard alluded to secondhand is that they put it up there by accident. Uh, so things like um, smartphone apps could pull it down for for drawing pictures like this and then people started harvesting that data with their own uh, scripts and putting it in their own databases and baseball kind of said well it's out there now so 
will keep doing that for at least this generation of data. So with all that, uh, there are already these websites online like um, Fangraphs and Brooks Baseball that actually do a lot of plotting of this, this data. So if you wanted a real quick picture of what, what people are kind of seeing with this stuff, you can uh, go on those websites and uh, get, like in this case, this is, a, this is a heat map of the strike zone showing where the most pitches were thrown. But I had some issues with the way the, the graphs were kind of limited and you couldn't make really complicated queries like search, search for only pitches in certain situations or that had certain results and you were kind of limited to the power of whatever web interface they gave you and they just had a relatively small number of drop-down boxes. Also, I had some minor complaints about just the way the plots were formatted and having already done this all the way through grad school, I figured if anyone could make better plots, it would be me and Matplotlib. <laughs> so some of the questions I had was, again, just uh, could I do plots with different subsets of pictures, pictures and uh, categorize pitches better and uh, so I, this could be a whole nother talk about just how I grab the data and they're basically XML files on the website so you need some uh, XML parsing to get it into a database. It's, it's obviously stored in a database on their end because it's all in a pretty well normalized schema and has primary keys and everything so the importing is mostly just converting that into uh, either SQL or um, SQL alchemy arguments and uh, putting that back into a database. And then have another script that's a SQL alchemy client and uses a bunch of matplotlib to uh, make the plots that I want. And like I was saying, I was in the past month or so uh, tearing up all the interface and uh, thinking about how it would look on a website so and kind of setting out to learn more about Flask and uh, web development so kind of used that as my proving ground and got halfway there and then uh, kind of put all those put all those features on hold when I went back to fix it up to talk about this week and the examples, I should probably just copy them over from this one. So I'll just really quickly show you two plots because they're, they kind of tell a fun story and they're fun to look at. Uh, one of these is, let's see here. This is basically showing a, not quite all the pitches he's thrown this year, but uh, a large fraction of them. Um, this is basically the profile of Chris Sale, who's the, 
here of the south side this year, uh, or one of them, he's helping the White Sox stay competitive in the uh, playoff race this year where they were expected to go exactly nowhere. So he's a pretty hard-throwing left-handed pitcher, and what this is showing is basically from the catcher's eye looking at the pitcher where his different kinds of pitches are moving after he lets go of them. So uh, for the most part, he throws these two kinds of fastballs, and they, they tend to run towards his throwing arm, and they, every pitch drops, but they don't drop as much as others because they have a lot of backspin, and that generates a little bit of pressure under the ball. Then he throws a bunch of change-ups, which are, you can't see the speed in this plot, but they're slower, and they drop more, and otherwise kind of look like fastballs out of a pitcher's hand. And he throws a bunch of sliders, which are a, kind of a hard-breaking pitch that move in the opposite direction relative to a fastball and uh, generally generate a lot of swings and misses if, if he throws it right, and he has a pretty good one. So he's a pretty conventional hard-throwing pitcher. And then there's, uh, to contrast, is R.A. Dickey, who's a pitcher with the New York Mets, and he has he's basically been a... Uh, fair to mediocre pitcher through uh, his career and it's been late in his career and suddenly he's having this year where he's one of the best pitchers in the majors and he comes at things entirely differently. He throws uh, mostly a knuckleball and the funny thing for uh, as most baseball fans know is Knuckleballs are this mysterious, mystical pitch that uh, nobody nobody knows where it's going to go, including the pitcher. So he <laughs> he throws one, and sometimes it breaks right, and sometimes it breaks left, and sometimes it drops, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's a much softer pitch than uh, pretty much anything a Chris Sale would throw, but it forms this kind of big blob here that um, kind of represents that unpredictability where sales different types of pitches are a little better clustered together. So if you know sale, if you know sales next pitch is going to be a fastball, you, well, not you, you or me, but a, a professional baseball player would have a fair chance of hitting it. If you know Dickey's next pitch is going to be a knuckleball, you essentially know nothing because, uh, because not even he knows what it's going to do after that. So, yeah, and after getting all this in environment working, I was kind of messing around with other plots and trying to dig into those questions, and I'm probably going to break it again when I uh, go back and uh, try to mix in some other technology. But... It's kind of how I'm using Matplotlib for fun these days. Yeah? Um, are there orange dots underneath? Like the whole one scanning kind of transparency or a way to see overlapping data points? Um, yeah, I, I should look into if there's a better way to do that. Um, in this case, I, I, I'm pretty sure they're clustered up here, and there's, there must be a few underneath. So. One thing I did do, and um, I don't have those figures ready, is, but uh, just tell it to leave, leave the knuckleballs out of this picture and just draw the, the red ones, which are the fastballs that he occasionally mixes in, and just look at them separately on different plots. But yeah, this, this plot, I agree, is not perfect because it has that overlap and things are being drawn over each other. And that's another thing where I've been using Matplotlib a while and it's probably got a way to do this better that I don't know about yet. Yeah? That's actually one thing that, uh, well, that's part of the Major League Baseball data, so it's in the XML files you can download. Uh, and then people talk on the web about how their, their classification algorithm isn't the best. 
and like they they'll mix up sliders with curveballs and uh, change ups and splitters. I'm not sure there's even a real difference, so it's kind of guessing at which is which if a pitcher claims to throw both of them. Is that because of the way the data is presented coming out of the MLB site, or is there a reason for that? I mean, assuming we're looking at sort of the ball as it crosses the plane of the plate here. Yeah. So what's the advantage of the polar coordinates? Yeah, the polar coordinates, they actually they carve up the data in different ways. So in this case, I was... Well, I, I'd need to go back and look if I was calculating the, the break angle myself and uh, then just applying the, the break length that they give you. But you can certainly plot it on XY coordinates as well. They, they'll give you the, the pitch movement in terms of just X and Y coordinates as well. So, so I've made plots in different ways and yeah, seen, seen roughly the same story in this case. But yeah, the, the, they just give you the, the data as it's crossing a plane at the front of home plate. So, yeah, if you had, if you had something that was kind of uh, a backdoor pitch or something that came in from the side, because the, the strike zone by the rulebook is actually a three-dimensional um, area, then you, you might get misled by this data. But that's, that's so much closer than the degree of accuracy that umpires achieve anyway that it's not really worth worrying about. That's an umpire. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's all I uh, had to show here and uh, just wanted to share something fun along with what I was doing for, uh, for work for several years. And I'll probably be experiment experimenting with it some more and I will have actually got it on GitHub, so I'll email a link to the list if people wanted to play with it. I've I've set it up on my laptop and on my desktop, so I've at least got it somewhat possible to actually port it onto a new machine, but I wouldn't guarantee you that it's any fun. <laughs> so that's all. Yeah. How real time is the data that comes through the, the, the baseball um, They, I'm not sure if they put it up as the game's in progress, but certainly by the next day. I mean, they're, they're doing the, they're putting that data up for their, uh, that flash app they have on their website and for smartphone apps and everything. So they're, they're generating it in real time and it's just a matter of when they make it available. working with Brian at Textura now, so I'm, uh, I was a little worn out with academia and wanted to do something purely software related uh, for a change, so. Uh, 
I I would imagine before too long it's going to be where you could just spend a hundred dollars and sequence like your uh, your sourdough starter or something and find out what's in there <laughs> and, and and do all this stuff for uh, finding out why your bread tastes the way it does. Yeah, they are, they're a big part of it, and yeah, with, without them you'd certainly have less, less production and less consumption of carbon dioxide and uh, the ocean in general, not just the, the bacteria we studied, but uh, there are photosynthetic eukaryotes and uh, they're a big part of it. That's, I mean, that's not exactly why our lab got into it. We were, we were more interested in the, just the pure science of knowing what's out there and understanding how their, how their, their diversity and uh, how their genetic diversity interacts with where they can grow. And uh, that just teaches us things in general about uh, the way these have evolved. And, but yeah, there's, We've certainly made that pitch in the past and will continue to. It yeah? R -Python, R -Python as well. uh, the the R Python interface, I yeah, I actually heard about that around the same time as I switching heard about was switching to Matplotlib, so never got around to doing much with that. But yeah, I've I've gone back to R and experimented with it some more because there's just so many packages there if you want to do a specific statistical statistical test that uh, eventually I'll probably have something that I want to get from Python to R and I'll have to look at that again. Thanks. Yeah. I, and if you've, if you've read the preview on the website I had kind of a two-part talk. One was how I was going to use, I was, I was using uh, matplotlib for surviving graduate school, and the other was how I was using matplotlib for goofing off uh, when I was um, finished with grad school. And uh, you'll, you'll see in a couple of minutes how I kind of used the same, same stuff I learned in one arena to have a little more fun in the other arena. So what I was what I was doing was first plotting uh, genomic data from the bacteria that I studied in grad school, and you can see a little one of them in the corner of the screen there. And the other thing I was doing was uh, kind of goofing off with this data that Major League Baseball has on their website that kind of shows the behavior of all the pitches they, uh, their pitchers have thrown over um, a few years now. So the first half of the talk, uh, what I was doing in grad school, I, the lab I joined has been studying this cyanobacterium prochlorococcus for now, uh, well they actually are the ones who discovered it in the late 80s and they've focused on it ever since. And the, the reason they found it so interesting, there are, there are several reasons. First of all, it's actually very, it's a very simple organism. It's, uh, most of them are about half a micron across, which is pretty small even by the standards of bacteria. Uh, they divide once a day, which is pretty slow compared to the usual lab rats like E. coli that are means of the cell division genes, they kind of avoid those hot spots and they're in uh, what are the, the lower parts of this graph and don't uh, vary so much between um, the sequence examples. Was, was there a question?
Um, the yeah. Uh, the question was about the, the iron stress and phosphate stress example I mentioned earlier, and how there are, how genes relating to resisting phosphate starvation or, or surviving iron starvation are found in different parts of the world in Prochlorococcus. And what what the questioner was asking is, are those genes then concentrated in the, these highly variable islands? And the answer is very much yes. And that's been one of the one of the big stories we've kind of developed in the in the time I was uh, in the lab, and I wasn't I didn't have so much to do with the iron or phosphate starvation stories, but I had a lot more to do with tolerate uh, the story of how different strains tolerate changes in light intensity, and that's actually what I was showing here when I first made this plot. Um, you see in the legend I'm talking about HLI genes. The HLI stands for highlight inducible. And these were genes that were known for some time to be upregulated when these cells are exposed to changes in light intensity. Variability, and they are the the kind of the hot spots for relatively rapid genetic change in the Prochlorococcus lineage. And conversely, if you plot those core genes or the the photosynthetic gene, Pro actually thrives in the areas of the ocean that are kind of the the most difficult to grow in because the uh, nutrient concentrations are lowest. So it's a little ironic that they're most numerous where it's the most difficult to grow, but the important thing there is that there's less competition from other more complicated cyanobacteria or, or photosynthetic eukaryotes or other things that compete for the same niche. And Prochlorococcus with its small size and again its simple genome and uh, simple cell architecture in general has an advantage in um, in surviving in that that kind of environment, and yeah. I, Do you want to try to hang out? I worry that the other pictures will be as bad as that first one, but I guess they're. I guess it's just that. Well. Well, let me. 
Yeah. Yeah, most of these are... Okay, yeah. Hey, Greg. Yeah? Brian has his announcement, too. So oh, okay. We want to take a quick break. Yeah. Because I think it's... Yeah. Okay, so guys, real quick, we're going to break in. More like, uh, more like uh, once in a hour or half hour. Uh, most of the genomes we study are uh, less than 2,000 genes, and that, again, even by the standards of bacteria, is pretty tiny. There are there are simpler bacteria that grow in very specialized environments and have lost much of their ability to kind of keep themselves, sustain themselves, and they, they live as uh, symbiotes inside of other organisms. So they have smaller genomes. But here we have a bacteria that has a small genome and yet has all the tools it needs to be a, an ox oxygenic phototroph. That is, it splits water and fixes carbon dioxide in photosynthesis like a plant chloroplast does. So that means it needs this whole package of genes for the for encoding photosystem one and photosystem two and the, the carbon concentrating and carbon fixing mechanisms. And that takes up a pretty big percentage of the genome. And I'm not sure what the, uh, yeah, that was, displaying better on the other one, but that was just a uh, going to be a picture of the um, uh, let's see if I hmm? yeah that yeah that was just a map of the world and showing where uh, where the chlorophyll concentration is highest and lowest and what what the point of that is for prochlorococcus is that 